because I sent it at the same time. Um, and then Ray and Maite, did you get a notification saying? Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the September MAC meeting. My name is Maite Turian. I'm the chair of the Springs Municipal Advisory Council. And I call this meeting to order at 632. And um, esta reunión um, cuenta con interpretación al español para escuchar el canal de español. Si está conectado en Zoom, por favor, utilice el botón de interpretación a parte de abajo derecha de su pantalla. Es un icono de un globo. Oprime y selecciona español y automática, automáticamente escuchará esta reunión en español. So, bienvenidos a todos. So, um, Vice Chair Roulette, would you please call roll? I will. Um, Chairperson Alcaraz is here. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Chairperson Perot. Here. Chairperson Lombard. Here. Chairperson Goldman, I believe is absent. Uh, Chairperson Reyes. Here. It's here. I'm here. And Maite, you are up here. Excellent. So we are ready to go. All right. Thank you. So if this meeting appears to be hacked at any moment, at any time, we will end the meeting. So just a reminder of that. Um, we're going to... I'm going to ask if there are any amendments to the minutes. And if there are, please let us know now. And if not, can we get a motion to approve? Thank you. I'll make I a motion to approve the previous meeting's minutes. Second. Um, Ray um, motions and Hannah seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Okay, so it's time for public comment. We'll have three minutes to make a public comment. Please use the raised hand feature and we will promote you to a panelist. Um, and if you want, you can call in as well and make a public comment or you can um, also send us an email to make a public comment. Um, we do wanna let you know that uh, we have checked with County Council about the chat feature and the Q and A feature, and we will have it disabled during the meeting. Um, it is a Brown Act violation, and I know that there were some questions about that in the past, uh, but it turns out that it is. And so I'm sorry to the other orgs who were using it, who are under the Brown Act, but they're gonna be asked not to use the chat and the Q and A as well. So uh, just a reminder that we can't, we can't use it. So, um, we do want to offer lots of opportunity for public comment. So you can call in, you can um, come to the meeting, or you can send us an email. We also aren't able to answer public comment on Facebook either. So, the, but the three ways are email, call in, or come to the meeting. So, are there is there any public comment on agenda item on items that are not on the agenda? I see no hands. We'll give it a sec. Okay, we will move on. We have, um, there was there was someone, Amy Pearl did announce that she would like to, we have for community event announcements, there was some things here I could read real quick. Is that okay? It was in chat. Are we allowed to do that? I don't, did you, I, that must've been before. Before I yeah. just made the chat announcement? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or Let's I... Why don't you do it in community events, which is coming up soon? Right. That's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Next. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So we've done public comment. We're moving on. Um, okay. So, Ray, guess what's next? Community events. That's what. That's what I was. I was trying to give you a segue there, but. <laughs> Thank you. I did had caught up in the paperwork. Uh, I, can, I can, um, I don't know, Amy, do you want to, um, if you raise your hand, if you want to, uh, uh, do this or I can read it. I don't see your hand. Oh, you got it. Here we go. I'm going to allow Amy to, to talk. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Amy. 
you can you can read it. Although in addition to what I posted there, uh, Susan Gorin also had some additional uh, COVID testing resources on her page. Okay, very good. Now that, sent, now that you sent me there, I was like, oh, look, she has other resources. All right, so I'll, I'll read what Amy wrote. She, she wrote that there'll be free COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Uh, check out uh, socoemergency.org backslash vaccines Wednesday, 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. and Saturday noon, 3 p.m. at Sonoma Valley Community Health Center and uh, the address 19270 Community or, uh, Sonoma Highway. Uh, and also Tuesday, 4 p.m. 7 to 7 p.m. at La Luz on uh, Greiger Street. Um, uh, both uh, places, uh, walking in without appointment is okay or call 707-939-6071. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Are there any other community event announcements? Mari Carmen. Hi, uh, thank you, Amy. I, I work for the health center. So thank you for, for helping me give that, um, that outreach announcement. Um, I would also like to announce that we will be having a pop-up vaccine clinic at um, Altamira next Tuesday, the 5th of October from four to six. And we will also be at the Glen Allen Fair on October 10th from uh, one to three in Glen Allen. But before that, just really quickly, um, I don't know if this is an okay time to make a quick presentation or should it be under public announcement? Is this okay? This yeah, is okay. community event announcement. So on behalf of Summer Valley Community Health Center, I would like to uh, present this plaque to the um, the Springs Municipal Advisory Council, um, uh, uh, representing our appreciation during National Health Center Week for all your support and collaboration, especially with the beginning of the Neighbor Fest and the pop-up vaccine clinic. So, thank you to everyone. Um, I will be handing this to uh, one. I would like to meet with. Um, Maite and, and Ray, um, and, and give it to you, deliver to you in your, in your hands. So we can, uh, I will send an official email to Karina to deliver this. Um, so thank you all. Thank and you. Um, you will also get some, um, some C's candies that they could be shared with the, um, the councils um, three at each time. So there's no brand act violations. <laughs> thank you, Karina. Thank you. I mean, Mari Carmen, thank you so much. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, any other community announcements? Okay. So many of you have noted, I just want to, uh, Karina left me some beautiful notes. And uh, those of you who have driven around town know that Caltrans is out there in full force. And the work is anticipated to go through the month of October. So just be aware of that it's Highway 12. And it will be through the next month. So glad that the roads are getting worked on. Okay, so I'm going to do my update now. Uh, I always want to appreciate all the folks who make this happen. Bob at KSVY, uh, Jordi and Anna for interpreting for us tonight, Lynn Marie for taking notes, and Karina for everything you do to make this meeting happen. Thank you so much. Just all your efforts and everything you do, and we hope you're feeling better soon. Um, again, the, the chat and the Q&A are disabled during the meeting. Um, also, I just want to remind everyone that um, the council does not have any land use authority. Just a reminder of that. We are working on um, getting someone to uh, represent the uh, s that alphabet that I can't remember the the C I, S V C A. Thank you. Um, to be able to talk to us about what's happening in the area. We'll also have the Madsen uh, project manager come to our next meeting and he'll give us an update. Um, I know that they're in the news again, so we'll have some information about the work that they're doing. 
Also, if you have any communications with any county folks or anyone else, please make sure you're looping Karina in so that she knows what's happening and she can track the information. And then uh, in an effort to streamline our meetings and make things a little go a little quicker, we're gonna try a new protocol tonight when it comes to presentations. So I wanna go through that with you. So we're, it's, we're in the learning period. So I'm going to share it with you now, and then I'll have to remind you during the meeting the way this is going to work. So the presentation will happen, and then there'll be questions by the, by the commission. I'm going to take those questions and summarize them at the end. So you're not, there's not going to be a back and forth between the presenter and the council members. You'll ask your questions. I'll collect them. And then I will feed them back to the presenters during the meeting, and then they will answer. Um, and then that will be the same way the public will operate. I'll collect the questions, feed, feed them back to the presenters, and then they will answer. So I'm going to be the repository to kind of summarize. And if I don't capture something, please let me know. But I'm actually, my superpower is summarizing. So I think I'll be able to, to hopefully represent all of you really well. And if I don't, let me know. Uh, but that's our, um, that's our hope to try to to not have that back and forth, which sometimes extends the conversation a little bit longer than we wanted to. The other thing that we did is we put time limits on everything. So now if we aren't finished with that topic in that amount of time, we can either, we can stop and request that we add more time to it or that we push it to another agenda item if it looks like it's gonna be too long. But we're working really hard to bring down, um, we have, bring down the length of the meeting. Um, materials. They are, we're getting to the, them to you as quickly as we receive them. And it doesn't always, you don't always get them in a time that you can look at them. So, but if you do get them in a, in a, in a manner in which you have a, an opportunity to look at them, I would suggest reviewing them so your questions can start to be formulated. I tend to like to hear the presentation, so that's the way I operate. But, um, and the reason we're gonna continue holding the presentations is because this is an opportunity for our community he to hear these things. Otherwise they don't have that opportunity. So this is why we do this is so that this information can be broadcast in multiple channels and in multiple ways so folks can get the information. Um, okay. Again, back to the CV, CV, SVCAC, we are working on getting a liaison. We also have an open seat for that. Later on, we're going to hear from the redistricting commission with from Ray and um, Herman Hernandez are gonna talk to us about the work they've been doing with redistricting. So we look forward to hearing from them. And I don't see supervisor, I don't have, that's the end of my chair uh, commentary. I don't see Supervisor Gorin at this point. If she sh if she is able to make the meeting, we'll we'll um, insert her in the agenda when she's able to arrive. Territory, I'm trying to reach out to Supervisor Gorin. Haven't heard from her. Okay. Um, we can skip her item and then come back to it if okay. you'd like to continue. Thank you. And then un recordatorio que este junta está disponible en español. Si um, hacen un clic en el icono del globo, pueden escuchar la junta en español. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to the annual report. So we need an approval of the annual report. You've all had a chance to look at it. We need to approve it here so that we can move it forward for Supervisor Gorin to take it to the Board of um, Supervisors. And we have made the changes that have been requested by the council. So um, is there a motion to approve the final report? I'll make a motion to approve the final report. Is there a second? All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Report's done. Yay. That's a big deal. <laughs> so thank you all. OK. The next item. Um, <clears throat> so after looking at the calendar and going back and forth with um, 
this Tuesday date because there had been requests from people about changing the meeting date. And one of the reasons, and I had been very like, this is the date we all agreed to, this is the date we're gonna continue with. But it was brought to my attention that there are meetings that take place after our meeting and there and it's particularly the C, C, SVCA meeting that that's conflicting and then there's a board of supervisors meeting on Tuesdays as well which makes it difficult for Susan to to be at our meetings so we are making a proposal and we don't have to vote on it now um, unless you're all like yeah that sounds great but we can have a little bit of discussion about it and then we can bring it back to another meeting because we have some time but here's the proposal we suggest that we move it to the first wednesday of the month that we start at six o'clock the first we would have our october meeting at the at the regular scheduled time at the end of the month we would skip November because we had generally skip during the holidays and the November meeting would fall during the Thanksgiving holiday week. And then we have our December meeting the first Wednesday of the month, which would be December 1st at 6 p.m. So we'd start a half an hour early and we would be the first Wednesday, which would then allow the um, SVCA to update our, uh, to update us and um, instead of waiting an entire month. And Susan would be able to join more easily. So that's the proposal. Can we are vote there, on it? We can vote on it or we can talk about it uh, if there are questions. So October, October is normal, skip mm -hmm. November, start first Wednesday. 6 p.m. December. Sorry. Well, I guess if our 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 our, our goal is to be a voice to Susan and, and, the, and the board, it would be helpful if she was here. So it makes sense to me. Um, yeah. I'm wondering how that affects like the uh, the folks who support us, like Lynn and all the other people who support us. Yeah. Lynn, that works for me. Thank Great. you. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that we'll continue to meet via Zoom. That is our, that is the, that is where we are right now. Yes. Okay, that could change if going it was in person, it would be harder. Uh, change, I mean, ultimately we would like to get back to in person, but that may not be until the spring. Because of the 6 p.m., Mary Carmen? Uh, we have vaccine clinics every Wednesday that right. I run. What time does uh, that go? We finish at 6.30. Hmm. Um, but um, if it's via Zoom, it's easier for me to. Sure. But if we can do 6.30, that would be awesome. But if not, you know, I, I can deal with okay. it once a month. I'm okay with 6.30. We thought we'd change, make it a little earlier to, for folks. But if 6.30 is agreeable to people so that we can accommodate you. Is that okay it, with everyone? Fine by me. Yeah, that's fine by me. It works a little better for me too. It gives me some unwind time before I have to sit yeah. down. Yeah. The plus side too is that when we smack into the um, holidays, at the Thanksgiving and then the, um, uh, you know, the winter holidays, um, that we won't we won't have that congestion. It seems like that's a good thing. Yeah. Hey, Seuss, would that work for you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay, the only one that's not here is Avram, but if we're comfortable voting on that change, it sounds like people are agreeable to it. Sure. Is there a motion to move our meetings beginning in December to the first Wednesday of the month, we will keep the 6.30 start time? I'll make such a motion. Ray, is there a second? I'll second. second. Anna. Hannah and Iris, Iris, Hannah. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent, we've moved the meetings. So Supervisor Gorin, you got here just in time. We moved our meetings to Wednesday. We hope that's a little easier for you. Well, it, I'm, I'm hopeful it is too. I've had a very, very, very long day, another one. Um, 
Let, don't even talk to me about cannabis. Five hours of cannabis cultivation. Oh my gosh. And there is no compromise. People are angry on both sides of this issue. Uh, but we did give direction today uh, to staff to bring a number of the items forward. We had a, a little split vote on some of them, but this is not policy making. This is giving direction for what we would like to see in an ordinance coming forward. And along with developing the ordinance is the development or the crafting of the environmental impact report to study the impacts from a number of those potential policy items. We're, we have been, I, I think I can legally say we've been skating on thin ice. Um, we were, prepared for a legal challenge with the fact that what we were doing had not been included in a comprehensive EIR. So we decided a number of months ago that we would take the safe route, probably what we should have done a couple of years ago and crafting the, uh, the ordinance and the EIR to be legally defensible for the policies going forward. But in the meantime, if you participated in any of the listening sessions, thank you, first of all. And you probably found that uh, people are passionate on both sides of this issue. It's not so much the dispensary issue and the whole uh, distribution system from cultivation to manufacturing to dispensary. It is where we are cultivating. And in general, people don't want to live next to cultivation zones because of the odor, because of this, the scenic resources. They're often not always um, beautiful to look at on the hills and the valleys. And they may be a little nervous about the security. I'm not, but people may be. So uh, as we move forward, we'll be looking again, trying to define neighborhood compatibility where we should be cultivating and recognizing that often the cannabis industry is the industry where young folks want to get a foothold, a toehold in the economic ladder. So more often than not, our cultivators, our farmers are young folks and they can't afford hundreds of thousands of dollars to purchase large parcels of land they want small areas to craft cart uh, cottage grows or 10,000 square feet uh, coming together with other um, small growers. And we did take last week a pause on the multi-tenant operation because some were absolutely legit legitimate and different growers coming together each 10,000 square feet to total an acre. And some were, were skirting the edges and um, loosely connected with each other and representing large growers. So uh, we're trying to figure out how we actually ascertain whether they're small, especially local growers, or whether they're larger growers uh, wanting to uh, avoid some of the, or take advantage of some of the loopholes that we have crafted for small growers. So it's going to take a long time to get through the uh, environmental impact report and analysis. One of the primary uh, areas of concern, well, I think they're all legitimate, but people are really nervous, especially in the second year of severe drought. Where is the water coming from? And we have a classification system for groundwater uh, throughout the county. Classes one and two have pretty available water, three and four somewhat sketchy water supplies. So we may try to analyze where water availability is and then specify those areas for cultivation, recognizing that the growers will probably have to um, really conserve during these periods of extreme drought, <coughs> similar to what the the farmers in the North County are doing currently. So it's mostly about cannabis, cannabis, but uh, we are able to purchase a former cannabis cultivation site, 120 acres at the end of Cougar Lane. And 
<coughs> excuse me, I have a little tickle, and annex that into Hood Mountain State Park. I actually, one of my virtual backgrounds was taken from the top of that. It was just gorgeous. That was before the glass fire, but it was full of cannabis debris. Well, guess what? The glass fire took care of all of that debris, poof. So uh, it's a little scorched, but we now have another 120 acres in Hood Mountain Regional Park. So you can get to it from the Lawson edition, give, it, give regional parks a little bit of time to get the trail markers up. And the views are absolutely spectacular from the ridge. So I encourage you to do that when that is open. And we also had a discussion this afternoon regarding special event permitting for bicycle races, rides, foot races, and trying to streamline and uh, make permits easier to get for the parades like the Glen Ellen Parade and the Kenwood Parade, but also the bicycle races and foot races make it a little cheaper, a little easy to get. And, um, but recognizing that Anytime we have large group of riders or racers on the road, it makes it somewhat hazardous for folks to access those roads. So we're trying to create a master calendar for those events so that we don't have two or more events happening at the same location on the same day. So that is what I have to report from today's long meeting. Uh, next week, we get a little shorter meeting, but um, the rest of the year, pack jammed full of good things. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. Does the council have any questions for Supervisor Gorin? And we'll go to public comment after that. Iris, so I'm going to remember I'm going to take the questions and then summarize them for the supervisor. My question is about bicycle races and um, uh, actually uh, closing roads uh, so that there isn't a conflict between uh, cars and, and bicycles, is there any, or something to make that feel a little safer for, for everyone? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Supervisor Gorin? Oh, this is going so smoothly. I don't have to summarize much. Supervisor Gorin, could you please answer Iris's question about road closure and bicycle races? Well, Iris, I do understand your question. Um, I've ridden in uh, Levi's Grand Fondo ride where there were 3,000 or 5,000 uh, bicycle riders. It wasn't exactly a race. Uh, I actually found it unsafe. So I've stopped uh, participating in that ride. And, but the roads were closed for short periods of time. But often the, the problem we found with those bicycle uh, races and rides is that there were so many riders that uh, in rare instances, we had emergencies where ambulances could not get through because there were so many riders on the road. So you're right, it is a challenge and I'm very concerned about emergencies and ambulance and uh, certainly fire engines trying to get through the roads when there are that many riders. That's an anomaly. It's not usually that full. Um, we do have Tour de Fuzz and we have had Ironman in the past and the Santa Rosa Marathon. I know there's a marathon, a half marathon that often comes from Napa to Sonoma, ending in the plaza. And sometimes the roads are closed and sometimes they're not. Sometimes the intersections are controlled and uh, high, law enforcement waving the cyclists through and sometimes they're not. Depending, uh, depending on how many uh, are racing and riding, but always people are encouraged to stop all the stop signs. Who knows about the new law? Gee, I hadn't even heard about that law. A lot of, a lot of bicycle uh, riders end up sort of slowing, but not really stopping anyway, when it's safe to do so. So stay tuned. They're gonna be doing a lot of community outreach. And if you're interested, we can schedule a conversation with a Mac from Permit Sonoma. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. Is there any public comment at this time? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin, for being here with us this evening. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay.
So we also, in uh, an effort to not put the ad hoc work at the end of the meeting, um, we've moved it to the front so that people can hear about the work that the council is doing uh, in their off time, <laughs> which I don't think anybody here has any, but the time that they are spending on their ad hocs. So um, we'll start with Dana and emergency preparedness. I know she's been out there. I've seen her everywhere. So Dana, would you like to share with us some of the work that's been happening? Definitely. Thank you guys, um, everyone, always for the support. And, and it's been so nice to see some folks in person again. We've had some really great outreach opportunities. Um, Mari Carmen and I and um, Sylvia from the Sheriff's Department did a kind of a preparedness presentation for the Fetters Apartments, which went really well. Um, we have to reschedule the Celestine Gardens, the senior section of that apartment. Um, but we intend to you know, do the same presentation. And ideally the goal of that is to, for, for my end anyways, apart from informing folks of you know, preparation for emergencies, um, is to get some block leaders out of that complex. We'll do a training um, and get, get Map Your Neighborhood uh, implemented there. So that's exciting. Um, and thank you for um, the connection, always Mari Carmen. It's been a great support to have the health center. Um, the neighbor fest events have been great. I'm looking forward to those returns. Um, this past weekend we did, uh, we were invited by Vida to participate in the Mexican heritage event that was on the plaza on the 19th. That was a great event. So we had a great opportunity to connect with folks and share, get that, get that preparation information out. Um, and obviously being it, you know, a, a celebration of Mexican heritage, we did a lot of Spanish language um, interactions and sharing of information, uh, materials, all of that. So that was um, a great opportunity. Uh, that following Tuesday, the 21st, uh, we were invited to participate with Breathe Sonoma um, as part of their events at Sonoma Farmers Market. Um, and although we didn't necessarily um, make direct contacts with, with folks from neighborhoods in the Springs, we did have some of our block leaders attend, which was nice to see them. Um, but it was really, it was really a point of getting us out there and what we're doing and and we had some really great feedback. So that's nice to know that, um, you know, even if folks aren't jumping the gun to be a block leader, we understand the time commitment and the responsibility that takes, um, but folks are still supportive and um, are helping, helping continue the, you know, spreading the word. So we appreciate that. Um, some of the continuing outreach or, or excuse me, projects rather, uh, we're always mapping um, and we've we've learned that there are several other neighborhoods that aren't necessarily doing map your neighborhood specifically, but they are working in an organized manner. So we will be including them um, on, I'm working just on a Google map right now. I have hopes to make it a, a fancy GIS map. Um, so we'll be including them with our map just so that they are represented and even though they're not necessarily you know directly involved with map your neighborhood they're still doing the same work so and it's important work um, we do have another uh something that came out of our last block leader meeting was um folks wanted to learn how to use fire extinguishers um hands-on so we've been in in talks with um our partners at at sonoma valley fire district and we're getting the planning for that happening um, hopefully within, I, I'm hoping within a month, but it all depends on, on the fire department schedule. And we know that this is a, obviously we're, we're over our head in fire season. So um, speaking of that, there was a little uh, incident in one of our Map Your Neighborhood um, neighborhoods on our blocks. Um, it, it was actually in my neighborhood, just, just down the road and around the corner, there was a house fire. Um, and it, it luckily it was a small kitchen fire and nobody was injured, but the response from the fire department was huge. Um, as I checked in with the block leader, she said that they had every fire engine in Sonoma on their street. So it was, it made for an exciting, you know, time. Luckily, nobody was injured and not great damage. Um, 
but it's small things like that that are nice to we know the community and our neighbors will come together when it when it happens but it's also nice to have kind of somewhat of a plan and and know what to do should that happen so if those folks had needed help they would have been able to use their map your neighborhood resources so that was kind of a not a, a live training, but it was it was nice to see the connectedness that it that really does come out of it. And um, I think that's it for my update. Thank you, Dana. You've been doing a lot of work and I really appreciate it. Thank you on behalf of the entire council. So um, do you want to talk about Fire Safe Council, Ray? We're um I think we're we're waiting to hear back from Roberta, who is retiring, um, to give us. Uh, we've kind of reached, uh, I think, a good critical mass, and we need to. Uh, we were hoping to schedule a meeting with her, and then I think finalize like a, a a monthly meeting schedule for ourselves, and and then move forward with that. I, I know you've had some, um, some thoughts, and some you sent us some information that we can't talk about yet, maybe. But uh, I don't know. Do you have anything to tell us about that? That, that uh, not yet, but I yet. Okay. I will. So so in in our you know hopefully we can uh, you know between between the county level and our local level not have to go through the 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 whole um, difficulty of forming our own you know nonprofit. So that's that's the that's our goal, and we're still looking at that and to see. You know, so that that allows us to just be an association and move forward a lot quickly, more quickly, um, and start. Um, I hopefully there's some. Roberta said that there might be. She put in for some grants, um, so I'd like to hear back from her. She had, she thought there might be enough funding to help two or three get started. So hopefully we can just get going and, and identify and start getting our, um, our our documentation together for what we need to do to to. Uh, I forget what you call it. Do you remember Hannah the 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 first thing that before we do the CWPP, there's kind of like a planning phase, I guess. Uh, I can't remember what Lucas I, is I our remember. expert actually, and I don't remember the specific here. term. But but get that get that phase going, and then that kind of leads to the CWPP, and 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 that leads to grants and projects. So um, those are those are that's where we're at. We're we're turning the corner of this, and and hopefully we'll get some traction here moving soon. Um, I spoke with a group in uh, District 5 who um, has a fire safe council and I need to refer, I need to give you their names because they are, they're super willing to collaborate and help if you want to talk to them about their process. They've been pretty well established uh -huh. for quite some time. And we also talked to some folks in the green, um, Sonoma Greens as well. And they're very well organized as far as, as what Dana was referring to as far right. as map your neighborhood. So right. these other things that are happening around us that we can maybe benefit from what sure. they are. And, and the, and, and, and the um, guy up at the Grove Street um, uh, Fire Safe Council has, has offered mm -hmm. to help us anytime we want. We've got a lot of help. We, we've, we've been, you know, we went through the fire um, wise discussion and, 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 and things like that. So in a, in a pandemic so I, i'm sorry about the the timing of this but no it's we'll get there it, when we get there no absolutely thank you for all your efforts both you sure. and Hannah. thank you and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful to have hannah on board to 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 help with this and and hopefully be able to pass some of the reins on in the in the mac form later on yeah i've seen her out networking too oh yeah she's she's great yeah okay thank you uh community outreach Is that Mari Carmen and Jesus? It's me and Jesus. Sorry, Hannah. It's Hannah. That's okay. Yeah. Um, well, my community outreach at this point is I am diligently posting on Facebook and next door. And I actually was pleasantly surprised because um, I got in contact with someone I used to be in contact with who potentially would like to be on the Mac and definitely wants to be on the um, Fire Safe Council. So it is working. Um, and then Jesus had an idea that we didn't finish, but I think it's a great idea. So Jesus, if you want to talk about that. Uh, yes. Um, we're thinking about creating a um, flyer and maybe distribute it um, in the community. Um, 
and maybe um, have a, like a QR code so that people can just scan it and um, get directed to the um, Mac uh, website. Um, it's been um, kind of difficult to do it myself in my computer because um, um, I don't have the proper like um, resources, like um, yeah, resources to do it. But uh, I am on in it to maybe um, make a draft and present it to you. Um, and maybe if you liked it, approve it. And yeah, yeah, that's what I've been uh, thinking about doing. I've been also talking with different um, um, people in the um, co community about uh, our job. Um, I haven't heard heard anything from them back, but hopefully um, sometimes when I go, they're close, um, but I will try to reach out to them again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you both. And um, Hannah, your notes on um, the meeting are super, people really appreciate it, that it goes, that the notes that you're taking that um, go out in social media. So thank you for that. Thank you, that's nice to hear. Um, arts ad hoc. So Avram and I met with um, PRMD. I hope I get these acronyms right. And uh, we talked a little bit about what it would take to do some art projects. And basically anywhere we wanna go, it's really in the Caltrans purview with the exception of a couple of places. So we're gonna meet with Artscape um, on I think this Thursday and have a conversation with them about what kind of work they might be willing to collaborate with us on to see if we can get an art project accomplished. Um, we're also looking at maybe doing some lighting in some areas around where we had done it in the past in that um, area that's been identified for the plaza. So there are a couple of ideas out there and we're looking for collaboration with Artscape and um, and now we really understand what the we did not fully understand um, who who was responsible for what areas and it's really Caltrans that is responsible for most of the highway even if it's on private property and it faces the highway it's still Caltrans so that was all new information for us that we learned um, is are there any questions from the council about the ad hoc reports that we've heard thus far <laughs> iris and then hannah Thank you. Um, my, okay, I've noticed that there are other um, sort of s small spaces available in neighborhoods for um, that could be maybe for artwork. There are the communal mailboxes that, uh, you know, are just kind of weathered gray. Uh, I, you know, it would be cool to see if we could have, have those decorated too. Um, also, um, I, I remember you said that PG&E uh, was not happy uh, or they wanted to, to, to have control over uh, things being, you know, the, the um, oh dear, what do you call those? Um, yeah, the boxes. The bo big boxes, yeah, yeah, the vaults uh, being painted. And I thought almost anything could look better than the one that said, at, you know, that's actually on Vallejo and 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 um, and boys. It's a it's pretty pretty ratty looking and ugly. So <laughs> I would think they'd be happy for us to improve their property. Just saying, just wondering about that. If if it's also possible to ex, you know extend that into the uh, into neighborhoods too. So thank you. Thank you, Iris. Hannah, you mentioned that Caltrans is able to control it goes on private property if it faces the highway what if it's okay. a distraction okay thank you that's my understanding yeah any other questions we'll turn to public comment if there are any questions to or comments i don't see any hands all right, seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you so much.
Um, we if were... I may, Chair Turi, sorry. Yes. It's, it's Karina, I know I sound different. Um, can you also announce it in Spanish for those um, Spanish speaking um, members of the audience who want to make a public comment? Oh, si quieren hacer un comentario público, por favor, alza la mano. Usa el, hay un icono que dice raise hand. Si quieren hacer un comentario. Okay, thank you all. Okay. Y también quiero decirles que hay interpretación. Si quieren, si hagan un clic en el icono que está del globo. A la derecha de la pantalla, yo creo que es a la derecha. Tenemos interpretación disponible para ustedes esta noche. Muchísimas gracias. OK. Now we have our presenters. And I think I'm going to push the break back a little bit because the front end of this agenda has moved rather quickly. Um, so we're going to keep going for a few minutes. So today we have Dr. Baldwin and Dr. Kimura, um, and they are here from um, Sonoma County Health Services to talk to us. Uh, we had um, Dr. Mace last month who gave us some information about COVID, some data points, and there were more questions, um, and particularly in relationship to, there's a lot of community, there's a lot of confusion in some of the community, with some community members about isolation versus quarantine. Um, do I get a third shot? So there's, they're, they're here to help clarify some things for us. And we really appreciate their time and their energy and um, appreciate you being here. So Dr. Baldwin and Dr. Kimura, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us um, to speak today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, because we do have some slides prepared. Can everyone see that okay? Great. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna try to move through um, these topics quickly because I know we have limited time, but I would like to give just a, a brief overview of the case trends um, in the county and then also some updates on testing. And then of course, getting into the isolation and quarantine review because I think there were a lot of questions on that. Some of the slides at the beginning are um, you know, more epidemiological slides. And I think you've seen those from Dr. Mace before. So I'll try to go through this quickly in the interest of time. So let me just move this screen. There we go. So here we have, um, again, the overall county trends. So in this first box, we have new cases for 100,000 residents per day. So time is on the bottom here and the case rate is on the side and you can see um, this first big peak here was from the surge back in the winter, and then you can see it dropped down in the early spring and uh, early summer, and then went back up again with our most recent surge that was um, you know, most likely related to the Delta variant. So currently, though, our case rates have been coming down, which is encouraging. And then so most recently, as of last night, um, we're at 10.9 new cases. Um, here, this next square is, is looking at overall test positivity. So again, you can see a similar trend where there was a peak back with the winter surge, a decrease, and then most recently peaked again. But once again, we see that the numbers are now coming down and currently at 2.5% overall test positivity. The square below it is looking at the test positivity in the lowest HPI um, quartile. And so that also has been decreasing recently and is at 3% currently. Uh, the square on the bottom left here is looking at hospitalizations. So again, we saw this most recent um, surge with numbers trending down, um, but still you know, relatively high at 43 people um, currently hospitalized. And of note, um, you know, there, there have been 65 um, deaths related to COVID-19 since July 1st. And so you know, definitely the cases that we see are still serious um, and so important to continue to uh, work on our mitigation efforts. This next slide is looking um, at uh, case rate, but broken down uh, based on vaccination status. So this dark orange um, line here is for unvaccinated um, cases, and this dark blue line is for vaccinated cases. So you can see that there is um, a significant difference between the two. Um, and while you know, with time now we are seeing that rates are coming down, there still is a separation between um, 
uh, vaccinated, unvaccinated um, members. So currently unvaccinated uh, case rates are at 20.8 and uh, fully vaccinated are at 4.4. Um, so this slide looks at case trends by racial and ethnic group in the past uh, 60 days. So um, here, you know, in the square, we can just see the overall numbers um, uh, broken down by uh, racial and ethnic group. However, when you um, take into account population size, we can see these trends here, um, where we do see uh, increased case rates in Pacific Islander here in the green, um, Black and African American in this darker orange, um, American Indian and Alaska Natives in this dark blue, a Latinx here in this lighter orange color. Also looking at case rate trends um, by city in the past 60 days. So we can see that the, um, the greatest number of, of cases are occurring in Santa Rosa, which is here, um, Petaluma here, Ronert Park, uh, which is here, um, but, uh, and also in Windsor in this bottom corner. But relative to the population size, um, the weekly rate of new cases per 100,000 um, population is highest in Sebastopol, Cloverdale, and then in um, Sonoma, Sonoma Valley here. This slide is looking at overall tests per day in the county. So again, we have time uh, going across the bottom and the number of tests on the side here. We can see that the peak of our testing um, you know, was occurring back with the winter surge, but then demand really decreased um, over the, the spring and summer. Um, but here, or after um, July 1st, we saw that the demand really started increasing again with testing volume going up, and then a significant rise um, in, in testing volume um, with a change in our strategy that I will go into more depth um, in later slide. But we can see that testing volume now is reaching the same levels as they were back in the winter surge and volume remains high. So current testing volume is at 607.6 tests per 100,000 residents. And um, testing has increased for all race ethnicities, all age groups and geographies over the past month. Um, this is a looking at new, case, uh, new cases by age group um, over the past couple of months. So this is a cumulative um, a grouping. And so you can see the different age groups here on the bottom and then the number of cases on the side. So these two, um, you know, larger case groups are the, the 20 to 29 year olds and 30 to 35 year olds. Um, here you can see it broken down um, over uh, the, you know, with a timeline and, and two week increments. So you can see mostly that uh, it's skewed more towards um, August, which is more of when uh, the peak of our surge was occurring and then have been tapering off in the more recent weeks. Um, this slide is looking at hospitalizations by vaccination status. So again, um, you know, we know that unvaccinated persons are hospitalized at a much higher rate compared to those who are fully vaccinated. So unvaccinated again is in this lighter orange and fully vaccinated is in this darker blue. So overall, um, it's, you know, the hospitalization rates are seven times more frequent um, and up to 14 times um, more frequent during the peak of, of the Delta surge. And then this slide is looking at vaccine administration throughout the county. So over 680,000 doses have been administered. And um, currently we're at 84% of the eligible population in our county have been at least partially vaccinated. So next I'm gonna um, change topics a little to go back uh, to review isolation and quarantine guidance, because I know there's been a lot of questions and confusion about this, especially when you take into account um, vaccination status. So isolation, um, which is for positive cases, people who test positive, with COVID-19 um, is still the same for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. So if you test positive for COVID-19, you should still isolate. Um, and the isolation release criteria is also the same. So you need to be at least 10 days from the start of your symptoms or from your positive test date if you had no symptoms. Uh, your symptoms need to be improved. They don't have to be completely resolved, but just improved. And then also fever-free uh, without the use of any fever-reducing medications for at least 24 hours. So quarantine is when you've had um, a, an exposure to someone who tested positive 
um, with COVID-19. And so we consider an exposure um, where you're within six feet for uh, 15 minutes or more cumulatively over 24 hours. And so this is where the guidance has changed and differs between fully vaccinated individuals and unvaccinated or partially vaccinated individuals. So remember um, that fully vaccinated means that it's been at least two weeks um, from your final uh, dose of your vaccine. Um, if it's before that time, then you would still fall in the partially vaccinated uh, category. So for fully vaccinated individuals um, for, who are contacts or close contacts to someone who tested positive. Um, so it, it depends on if you have symptoms or not. If you do have symptoms, then you should still quarantine and test um, right away when your symptoms develop. If you don't have symptoms though, and you're fully vaccinated, then you don't have to quarantine unless you, you know, then develop symptoms. So during you know, this period, you would still you know, want to monitor for any symptoms for at least 14 days um, and test three to five days after your exposure to someone who, had, who was positive for COVID-19. Um, and again, you know, continue to monitor your symptoms for a full 14 days and uh, wear a mask during this time as well. And so these you know, are guidance that um, has been given by both CDC and CDPH. Now for unvaccinated or partially vaccinated individuals, um, the guidance you know, is similar to it was in the past, you need to quarantine. Um, and again, it's broken down by if you have symptoms or not um, on when to test. So if you have symptoms, then you should test right away. Um, if you don't have symptoms, then um, we recommend testing on um, day five or later. And that's because if your test on day five or later um, is negative, and you remain without symptoms, then you can be released after day seven um, from your exposure. If you don't test at all and you remain without symptoms, then you can be released after day 10. Um, of course, for all, again, all these categories, you should still monitor, self-monitor for symptoms for 14 days. And then there's been some confusion and questions around modified quarantine and what that is. So modified quarantine um, is something um, that has been put out by CDPH that's for schools only, specifically K through 12 schools. And this was created um, in an effort to try to keep children in school as much as possible. But there are specific requirements in order to qualify for this type of modified quarantine. So it has to be a mask on mask exposure, which means that both individuals, um, the case who tested positive and the contact both um, were wearing masks during um, their exposure period. So if any portion of their exposure, you know, that 15 minutes um, within six feet, if any, any um, portion of that was unmasked, then they don't qualify um, for this type of exposure. And also this wouldn't qualify for, you know, if there was a home exposure, you know, or somewhere outside of school where people would be, um, might be unmasked. Um, so again, it's a very specific uh, criteria, but if students do qualify for this type of exposure and they remain without symptoms, then they're allowed to stay um, in school and, um, and their after school care um, if, if that's you know, what they participate in normally. Um, however, they would not be allowed to participate in any extracurricular activities such as band or sports or choir or things like that. Um, during this modified quarantine period, they must test at least twice. Um, it's a 10 day period. Um, and if the second test is negative on day five or later, then again, they can be released after day seven. So now I'm changing gears a little bit and to talk about testing because there's also been a lot of questions about testing throughout Sonoma County. Um, and so, as I mentioned, because of the increased um, demand of testing, um, again, right around the, the beginning of the Delta surge, um, we transitioned our, um, our, our testing strategy from our small testing team, which could only operate a few sites within Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa City, um, to partner with other testing groups um, and companies to expand testing throughout um, and across the county. And so now we have um, the four partners that are listed here, Curative, Molecular Matrix, LHI, OptumServe, and Fox Home Health. And you can see on this map here, you know, how much more widely um, distributed testing is um, uh, throughout the county than previously. There's also been many questions on how to schedule a test. And so we did put a lot of effort into um, uh, re, uh, renovating, I guess, our, our, our 
a website to make it more user friendly and how to schedule a test. So first of all, if you do have a medical provider, then we always recommend that you reach out to them first. But if not, then you can go to our um, testing or our website, which is listed here um, and can be found on the SOCO emergency website. And there's a couple of different options um, that are available to help schedule for a test. So there's this calendar option where you can see the days of the week, um, you know, let, uh, uh, spelled out here, and then all the available testing sites listed under the days. So if there's a certain day that you had in mind, then you can go that way. Um, and then we also, as I have on the slide previously, have this map where it's actually these little icons are clickable. And if you hover above one of them, then you can um, see what testing sites are available. So you can look by geography or by date. Um, and then finally, you know, not, you know, if, if, you need further help or you're not able to access the internet, then you could also call um, our hotline. And we have both English and Spanish um, uh, hotlines available and our um, hotline staff um, are able to help walk you through and help you to get scheduled for a test. Um, and then finally, uh, there's also been a lot of questions and confusion about the types of tests that are offered and when, what test um, you know, is recommended at what time. So the main two types of tests that um, you know, are out there are the molecular test or the PCR test, um, and then also the antigen, also known as the rapid test. So first for the, the PCR test, um, so this um, is a test that's you know, been around for um, you know, more time that everyone probably is more familiar with. Um, it can take um, anywhere from zero to three days to result. Um, and that really depends on um, the lab and the test. And also, you know, with demand, if the lab receives a lot of specimens, um, then it can sometimes lead to a backup and take longer in resulting, but generally zero to three days. And most of um, our labs are, you know, have a turnaround time within 48 hours. Um, but this is, the PCR test is generally preferred. Um, and you know, can be used to confirm as a confirmatory test. Um, so, um, and I'll get into that a little bit with the antigen test. So this, the antigen test, it results in um, an hour or less. You know, the most common one that people hear about is the Binex Now test, which is about 15 minutes to result. Um, and so this can be useful um, for early diagnosis in symptomatic individuals, because you can test and um, you know, right away, if they test positive and they have symptoms, then we can treat that as a, as a, a positive case. Um, and also CDPH has, um, you know, advised or recommended that you can also use it um, when used twice or more um, in serial screening of uh, asymptomatic people for surveillance. It's a possible use for this type of test as well. And however, the issue um, with antigen tests is that they can have more false negatives. And so that's why uh, we recommend that if you are symptomatic and you test with an antigen test, and if that test is negative, it's possible that it's a false negative. So we would recommend in that situation to confirm it with a PCR test um, to make sure that you know, it's, it wasn't a false negative by antigen test. Dr. Kamora, can I, can I just make a, a comment? Is that okay? Yeah, this slide? absolutely. We, yes, the PCR is the preferred test and all of our current testing sites that people we are contracting with or working with are performing PCR tests. So all of those um, location things that came up, they are all PCR tests. However, we just want people to get tested as well. So if it's can more convenient or you can't get to one of the PCR um, sites, and you've got access to an antigen test, please, by all means, go ahead and get tested. And then, you know, we can kind of figure it out from there. But um, we, we just really want to encourage people to get tested. Um, and we understand that sometimes there's a little bit of a wait and for whatever, you know, reason, um, someone may not be able to get to the PCR test right away, but please, um, you know, just get tested. That's, that's the main the main goal. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Um, and actually, that was my last slide. So um, now I think I'll turn it back um, to the panel for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions from the panelists, the council members? Hannah? Is it possible for people to get um, like the antigen test at 
home? Like, can people just have like a stockpile of it so that they can test frequently? I can start and Dr. Trubino uh, or Kamora Trubino, if you want to chime in. I mean, people can get the home antigen tests, I think, at Walgreens in different places. So they're available. They're easy to, well, I'm not going to say easy to get because I think some places have been sold out. But theoretically, you can just go to, a, you know, a local chain pharmacy or someplace like that and get a home test. Um, we don't have uh, individual antigen tests for people. What we get from the state are kind of more in bulk where the expectation is that we're gonna be testing multiple people with that same uh, kit, because there's only one set of reagents in there. So we don't have that at the, at the health department, um, but uh, they are available on the market um, for people to use. We just caution a little bit um, with the home antigen tests. I think uh, they're a great idea. However, um, they can be subject to user, uh, um, uh, you know, like operator or where's units. So um, if you get a positive, you know, I would trust it and always follow up with your doctor. And if you feel like you might have COVID for another reason, and if it's negative, I'd still, you know, you know make a call to your, your primary care provider if you have one to just double check. Or um, uh, you can, you know, reach out to the, to the health department and we can, we can also you know, kind of interpret that for you as well. So we, it's, it's a little operator dependent, but we're not, you know, they're, they're there, they're unavailable. They're available. For people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? I had a question. Are there, um, do schools or other organizations require one test over the other? I, I'm wondering about that. Must you have a PCR for return to school? Are those things that are required? Or is there more flexibility around that? Schools, individual schools and, and school districts may be making that determination on their own, but we are not at, at, the, at the at public health. We say antigen or PCR in the in the our recommendations and things like that. So, so it's left up to the individual school districts to make those decisions. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go to public comment unless there's a question from the council. Okay. Anyone have comments this evening? Questions for the doctors? In Spanish, Maite. Hay preguntas por las doctoras acerca de su presentación de COVID. Okay. Well, thank you both for coming and, um, and sharing more information with us. I appreciate especially the modified quarantine explanation. That was, that's been very confusing for people. So Understandably so. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're like, it's modified what? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for inviting us. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. you. Okay, I think we'll take a quick break and then we'll have our final presentation from Ray and uh, Carmen Hernandez on the redistricting commission. So let's take a five minute break and we'll come back at 7.45. Okay, everybody, thank you. Oh, this is a topic that's getting a lot of attention lately. So we have Ray represents our valley and um, District 1. And we have Herman Hernandez, who's the community engagement liaison. And they're going to tell us a little bit about the work they've been doing. So thank you, um, Herman, for being here. And thanks, Ray, for representing us. So you bet. You. I I think I think Herman, um, besides besides the two-time pie-eating world championship, which I'll, we could probably hear about later, I want to hear about that. 
we're, we're really fortunate to have Herman here to present to us um, his work in outreach um, and, and what he's been doing with redistricting. So I'll let him take it away. And if we have any other questions at the, the end, I'd be happy to answer what, from my perspective, where, what, what's happening, buddy. So Herman. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairwoman Ituri and the rest of the um, Advisory Council. Thank you so much for your time this evening. What I really hope to do is just give you a quick overview of what the redistricting process is and then share a couple of the uh, community engagement opportunities um, for the Sonoma Valley and the Springs area. And um, we've been doing community outreach for the last three weeks um, to try and get as much community input and maps submitted um, to our uh, ad advisory um, redistricting commission. Um, and then let me just get into this very quickly. And I apologize because I can hear my puppy whining in the background and I'm the only person here right now. So bear with me. So I apologize if you hear any whining, it's not me, I, I promise. Um, but what is redistricting? It's something that happens um, every 10 years. It's tied to the census count. Um, Sonoma County is must redraw its five county board of supervisor district boundaries using new census data. Um, and give me one second. I'm so sorry, Ray, if you want to just quickly give an update. My dog just decided to be very, I don't know what's going no on. No worries. So. Go ahead. Go ahead, Herman. Oh, sorry about that. Yep. Um, I was going to say you could leave your, your screen up, Herman. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, yeah, I could just I can just pick up where, where Herman or Herman was at. So, what is redistricting? So, the process is ever ever five years we go through this. Um, and the state law requires that the, the cities and the counties talk to the communities and 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 get and get the communities engaged in the process by holding public hearings and and outreach, uh, which Herman is doing. And Herman, I just got, I'm just working on this second bullet and then I'll let you take back over. Um, I, the, next part, the next part is, is that the, the redistricting balances the population and um, go ahead, Herman. Yeah, so, so um, like Ray was just mentioning, uh, the most important part of this whole redistricting process is that the supervisorial districts have, uh, if not equal, close to equal representation in terms of people that live in the districts. Notice I use the term people that live in the districts. Um, you don't have to be, this is again, based on the census count. So we count everyone, our community members who are documented and our community members who are undocumented. Um, and the most important part of this process is having that equal population in the districts. Um, why it's an important process, it basically, if it's done fairly, um, the, it, we're bringing up the ideal of one person, one vote, and it's a reality. And one of the things that I'd like to uh, give kudos or a shout out to the Board of Supervisors um, in doing this process, um, I've learned that it has been over 60 years um, since the Board of Supervisors has had a redistricting commission that is comprised of volunteer community members. Um, I believe the last few times that they've done this, which again, it happens every 10 years, um, it was a, the, the redistricting commission was made up of the elected sheriff at the time, the elected district attorney, and the elected person that runs the voter registration office. So this is uh, the first time that uh, in a long time that they've had a group of commissioners of 19 community members that are soliciting <laughs> um, your feedback uh, and wanting to engage and be more uh, inside of the communities to really hear from them and I'm about to share some opportunities as to how, um, because one of the reasons why they hired me was because they identified seven communities of interest, uh, some geographically and some ethnic. Um, so we have our uh, coastal uh, community of interest, our black African-American community of interest, Latinx Hispanic community of interest, our Asian American Pacific Islanders, as well as our um, uh, tribal and native uh, community members um, and our LGBTQI uh, community members. So we are trying to get in front of every community. Uh, we've already done a couple presentations um, 
in the Sonoma area and the Sonoma Valley area, and there's more to come. Um, so if you're part of any nonprofit organization, community group, and you want this, this is a much faster delivery of the presentation. On average, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we kind of open it up for questions and answers. Um, the, but one of the other things why it's important to get involved is that this map that essentially the Board of Supervisors um, chooses will be in place for 10 years. Um, that equals five total elections. And once again, the commission was created to really help engage our historically disenfranchised, underserved, and our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities throughout the county. Um, the redistricting timeline. I know that's a little small, I apologize, but the redistricting timeline uh, for this first phase is all community input and maps are to be submitted um, by October 15th. So we have about uh, 18, 17, 18 more days to be able to put all that input into the commissioner's inbox because by October 18th, that commission of 19 members uh, will be um, presented uh, with three to five different maps, which um, then they're responsible for boiling it down to two or three maps that essentially um, goes through some public presentations and some community hearings. And then it gets presented to the Board of Supervisors. And then the Board of Supervisors will have um, three more uh, community hearings. And it's a federal mandate or federal law that they have to have a map selected by December 15th and the plan is to have one adopted on the 14th. So you can be part of the process along the whole way because they're always going to be asking for community feedback. You could do that through calling into their hotline or you could also do that through the redistricting email or reaching out to your uh, commissioners that represent the first district or reaching out to your supervisor and her team, Supervisor Gorn. Um, right now is the opportunity for you to provide um, your input on how the maps you um, you on how you want to see the maps developed, and how uh, what, like some of the questions that have been coming up, and this applies to the uh, Sonoma Valley and the Springs area. What happens if that is split up? Is that good for the valley, or is that negative for the valley? These are things that we're asking our community members because these are things the commission as well as our Board of Supervisors want, uh, want to know, and, and it's important that they hear from the people that live in our areas. Um, I won't get too much into the rules, um, but basically, uh, simply put, there are federal laws that we have to follow. Um, the main one being equal population per district. Um, there also is state criteria, and then there's some traditional redistricting principles that we also follow. But I, again, I have a short period of time and I kind of want to get down to the, some of, um, this is actually on, on actual, on Tuesday's Board of Supervisors meetings, they're going to have the updated um, census information that finally was released by our federal government. Um, and they're going to be hearing how that's going to impact the different districts. But these are assumptions here. And I, again, I'm sorry that the numbers are tiny, but as you might be able to tell, the first district actually, um, they're estimating um, is, is gonna have about um, 7,000 less community members than the fifth district, which would be the highest um, population out of any of those five districts. And one of the most important things to also know is the deviation um, in terms of the smallest uh, populated district and the highest populated district, it it's 10%. You can't go over that number. Um, and right now the sweet spot for the number that they um, are thinking they're gonna have to get in each district is about 99,954 people. So if you see the, the estimated population numbers, the first district has 96,544. So there's a chance that they might increase um, your population, your district's population by 3,000. Um, and that could impact some of your border areas um, where your district borders other uh, districts like the second district, the third district, and the fourth district. Which here's that map. Um, 
and I apologize again. I, I know you've been meeting for a while now, but I want to kind of get to the ways what we're doing in the Sonoma Valley area and how you can help us promote this information. But here are some of the questions and, and feedback that we're asking people during our focus groups, um, which we have two set up for uh, the Springs area. Um, and let me just go to that uh, upcoming opportunities. Um, so as you can see, we've been doing focus groups since September 20th. Um, the goal is to do at least two in each of the areas um, the communities of interest that the commissioners have identified. Um, the upcoming um, focus groups, and I totally understand this is during work hours, um, so we have been able to add um, focus groups for the week of October um, October 11th uh, in case we get requests from the community that the, these, these times don't work. But to, before I go there, just want to let you know, we did reach out to certain people that lived in the area. Um, and then we asked them to connect us to two or three people that they know might be interested in these focus groups that we then did a doodle poll that identified randomly that these two dates and times actually were the best for the entire group of people. That's how we came up with these dates and times. I did not make them because of my schedule. I made them based on the schedule from their community members in the Valley. Um, we also do have some virtual town hall uh, series that are coming up, which are gonna be, um, tomorrow's the first one, um, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., um, October 6th, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., and October 13th, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and these are gonna be opportunities for people from all over the county um, to participate and, and get educated about the process, because I think that's the, mo the biggest difference is in the past or from what I'm hearing from um, past community members is that the county was not as engaged with our uh, community members through, throughout our area um, to solicit feedback. So that's um, why we're having so many different opportunities because I think including myself, understanding this process was confusing at the beginning and it, why it requires more time in doing some educational presentations and then talking about um, some, of, some of these questions and, and soliciting feedback. And one of the ways that we do that is some of the tools that the demographer consultant um, has provided on the county's website are, uh, helps you visualize what districts can become um, and, and based on how they currently are formed. Uh, so it really inspires thought. Um, but some of the other opportunities are, there are gonna be what we're calling map drawing parties social distancing applies. Uh, we're doing one in uh, at La Luz um, in the Springs area. I haven't identified the exact location yet, but it's gonna be on October 10th. And I apologize, that is the incorrect time. I, I, I used one PowerPoint and I just got out of a, uh, sorry, no excuses. Anyways, I totally put the wrong time for the Sunday, October 10th map drawing party. It's actually from two to 4 p.m., not from five to seven in the Sonoma Valley area, so I apologize for that. Um, but there's definitely more information that I could share. I did share um, a lot of um, documents with Ray and uh, Karina this morning um, that are both in English and Spanish, um, where you can find more information on how to get involved in this process. Um, and understanding that I only had 15 minutes to do this presentation, I wanna respect my time but if there's any questions or, or, or comments that you'd like to leave, um, I encourage all of you to hopefully help us promote some of these opportunities for your community. Um, because it's very, as we just finished our coastal community uh, focus group, it was very interesting to hear their perspective on some of the things that we're talking about. Like does having two representatives on the coast, um, is that better or worse? Do you have an opinion for or against? And it was very interesting to hear their feedback. Um, so I would love to uh, provide as many opportunities. So if you see some, if you're, if you just don't like this uh, schedule for the Sonoma Valley, uh, feel free to contact me. You have my email address, um, and uh, I'd be happy to set something up the week of October 11th um, because everything needs to be submitted by the 15th. Um, so we're pretty fluid on this um, and we're uh, welcoming more engagements.
if there's the if the opportunities surface. So thank you so much uh, for your time. And um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer. Ray, if you want to add anything to that. Herman, that was that was a fantastic overview, and thank you so much for your for your work and reaching out. And as Herman says, this is a this is a, a map uh, draw, drawing a, a map driven process. So, um, the, you know, the 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 map drawing parties are great for anybody that's interested and in, you know really wants to do the hands on analog, sit there. You know, and I think it's great, you know, to be able to, I know we have to social distance and stuff, but, you know, uh, have a community discussion around that. The virtual town halls, fantastic. What we do need those to turn out into is though the input needs to be in the form of maps because NDC is going to, they say they will take anything drawn on a, on a, a you know, a paper napkin, or I would even assume a, a verbal description of a, uh, of a, a type of, um, uh, re, uh, a redistricting scheme uh, and, and submitted by email um, to the uh, those last two um, Herman had up the, the redistricting email uh, uh, website. Um, the other the other thing that I, I, I'm uh, I'm seeing is that um, we may have a bigger a bigger delta than than we anticipated. We don't we really won't know until. I guess October fifth at the Board of Supervisors meeting, but the um, the the data that I was able to see had a ten thousand um, was less uh, ten thousand people less than the the data that NDC has been using countywide, and I I don't have the old data to or the whole database or the ability to to look at it that way. So I'm curious what what we'll find out on October sixth um, or fifth. That's about all I got. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Herman. I think we have some questions from the council members. We'll start with Jesus and then Supervisor Gorn. Yes, um, I'm gonna I'll ask a very provocative question that, um, and I'm sorry for if I'm being naive, but I was uh, looking at the, um, the, um, how the census went in Sonoma County and each of the districts. And I just think that um, a lot, um, I didn't, the results don't quite to my, from what I see, don't quite uh, look um, like represent the community. I feel like a lot of the people um, in the districts in Sonoma County, especially um, Latin, Latinx, uh, were afraid to get counted. And I feel that that is something that um, is actually visual and is, it's been seen in the, uh, how the uh, census, um, 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 the results of the census because they were left out and I feel like um, even though you are very much hardly and very uh, trying to be very fair about how uh, redistrict um, uh, this uh, uh, our county, I feel like it doesn't correspond from my point of view, but I just want to make um, reaffirm that can reaffirm that the sense the veracity of the census and I know that it is very accurate but um, just um, maybe what are you what are your thoughts about it yeah that's a great uh, feedback or in comments and question Jesus um, so my, my main role here is actually not focused on the census counts um, I got hired on September 1st to do the community engagement part to try and get feedback on the maps and the districts. So I have to be honest with you, I wouldn't know how the census count was conducted by the county. Um, so I would feel uncomfortable answering that question specifically because I don't actually know. I'm just focusing on the community engagement of our communities of interest that were created by um, the commission. Um, but you do bring up important um, 
no, uh, facts and things that should be considered, especially as we move forward now that we better understand. For me personally, this whole census count was a learning experience because I'd never participated in it before. And then we got the pandemic, so we all got even more distance from each other. But what you just talked about is one of the main, uh, definitely concerns that was brought up a lot. I remember hearing these conversations during the census um, outreach, and that's why they were part, the county was partnering with a lot of community-based organizations to identify hard to reach communities and build and leverage the trust that um, the CBOs have, our community-based organizations have with our Latinx and Hispanic and Latino communities. Um, but I, I, I'm more focused on the, this part that of getting feedback and um, engaging our community. So I, I can't really answer your question, Jesus, but I appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Um, so there's lots of questions happening. So I'm going to have Supervisor Gorin speak, and then I'm going to summarize the other comments that are being made. So Supervisor Gorin. Thank you. Um, Herman, thank you so much. A great explanation for uh, what the, the commission is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for applying for the commission. We may have had to uh, twist your arm a little bit to fill out that application, but we're so grateful that you're a part of it. Veronica Vences from La Luz Center also is serving on the redistricting commission. And uh, this is uh, just, Jesus, I think you're absolutely right. I think every census, we have elements of the population uncounted. We were hopeful that La Luz Center could uh, really go door to door and do what it took to get people counted, but COVID happened and it just, all of us were affected and slammed by the pandemic. So I think you're right. We are not as successful as counting as we'd hoped to be, but also remember that the first district potentially lost population because we've had multiple fires. Now, I think the census was completed before the glass fire, but it certainly did decimate uh, the first district from the, the Sonoma complex fires four years ago. So we may have lost population. We are still rebuilding in, in a large swath of my district. So that part potentially is uncounted. But I, I, I need to interject a little uh, political note. This is not an academic exercise. Uh, the redistricting is very important. And I use myself as an example. I was encouraged to jump into the race for supervisor because of some of the boundary changes that happened after the last census. And I am making it quite clear to all of you, in case you don't know, this is my last term. I am not running for re-election. So hear me now. And so that means that uh, the boundaries that are being drafted now, and um, you can be part of that solution, will encourage or, um, or prevent perhaps some folks from jumping into the race for supervisor. It's a little early, that race is 2024, but um, people are starting to come out of the woodwork already. So thank you all. Good presentation, appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor Gorin. So I have Mari, then I have Iris, and then Ray. I know. Thank you, Herman, for joining us um, this this evening. Um, I just just wanted to put out there that the um, portrait of Sonoma for 2021 should be coming out. I don't know if that information is going to be released before the submission of the redistricting. I think it's very important for people to know how our census tracks look be before we also make a decision. So I don't know how the, the timelines kind of overlap. And um, I think later when we can add to an agenda, I would like to add that as an agenda item for our next MAC. But um, Herman, muchas gracias por acompañarnos esta, esta noche. Thank you, Monica. Iris? Um, yes, and thank you, Herman. Um, is um, considering the concern that Jesus put out, um, and it's, it seems valid to me, uh, 
that and likely that um, the Latinx population and perhaps other um, uh, uh, immigrant communities in the valley were undercounted. Is there any way to work to balance that 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 you know of? Um, it's not you know as as we've said here. It's not a tiny little question. It's not. Uh, it's not just academic, um, because actually we would most, if we're adding from the, um, the second, third, and fourth districts, we're more likely to get uh, basically white people <laughs> added uh, in, into, our, into our district, um, which would change the, could change the, the balance of voting and everything. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Iris. Um, I'll, Ray? Um, I was just going to follow up on Jesus's comments. You know, we're looking for communities of interest. So if he knows of any community of interest, um, you know, that, that, that he wants to identify any of them, you know, go to one of these, go down to La Luz on Sunday and, and talk to Herman and, and, and maybe that you can figure out a way to draw a map of that. And, and, and identify that. That's really the only way I can see the input now. Otherwise, we're, we're really, I, the, the, our task is to look at the census data. Yeah, and to piggyback off of what Ray just mentioned, um, because of the outreach that we have been doing, um, we realized that it is a hard ask to ask community members, like your average Joe, like myself, to submit a map, um, either draw one or submit one through the tool. Uh, uh, the tools that they, the county has provided, which after uh, figuring out how to use the tools took, you, took me a, about a half hour to an hour. Um, they're actually incredibly awesome because it gives you a lot of the data, Mari Carmen, that you were just talking about where you can actually add layers. Um, you could find out what the renter, what the percentage of renter housing is in Sonoma County, percentage of multifamily housing high school diploma or higher. There's a lot of information that you can actually get from some of these maps. Highly recommend checking them out. But because we understand that there is some challenges towards either if you live in a rural area, you may not have access to quality internet. Um, there's also the technology gap. Some people may not understand, like for example, my parents, I don't expect my father or my mother to go on this map website and submit their own map based on the instructions that they've been given. So what I have been helping um, our county administrator's office do in partnership with the commissioners is encouraging people to, um, you should have received or you will be receiving, if you can see it, it's called the Community of Interests, Communities of, oh man, I'm all blurry, but it's mm -hmm. a Communities of Interest document that actually allows you to write out like a almost like a public comment, um, but you could submit it through email, the redistricting 2021 at sonomacounty.org, or you could call it into that hotline number and leave a voicemail to provide your public input. Um, they, so we're making it easier to provide input based um, on map research, your own just identifying your community and letting us know that this is where I live and this is my community and this is what I would not want to see happen to my community. That type of feedback is excellent feedback. But if you go to the last three questions of the communities of interest testimony document, it asks three questions that I think for me were incredibly thought provoking and helped me kind of say, oh, well, I have worked on certain things to answer these questions that define my community or who I'm trying to look out for. So they're like, has your community come together to advocate for important services like more translated information or health centers in your neighborhood? Have you won victories together or established traditions together? Or the last one, what harms have been caused because your voice has been ignored? Like poor health caused by pollution um, or industrial farms? What are the barriers to solving these issues? Those were some questions that for me, you'll find a series of questions on these documents and you'll probably wanna answer two or three of them, but this document was super helpful for guiding my own testimony and what I would consider what community I, I, I'm from and, and how I want that 
to be represented at the county level. I mean, another thing has so is to go back to your points. What I've been hearing a lot when we're talking to our communities of color is how can you build a district that allows you to empower and elevate um, our, not a knock on the board of supervisors, but it's all uh, one ethnicity, it's all white and that's all right. But some people are advocating to how can we create districts to elevate our communities of color so we can have more adequate representation on the board of supervisors. And these are all comments and feedback and even questions that you, want to submit to the um, commissioners that will help them develop the maps that essentially get presented to the board of supervisors and then they pick their number one map. And you're able to participate throughout the process by following the meetings. Yes, I know another meeting, we're all super busy, but it's a very important process. Thank you. Hannah? Yeah, uh, you read the seven communities of interest and I'm missing one, I have coastal, uh, Black, African American, Latinx, LGBTQI, AAPI, and Native American. And what am I missing? Um, hold on, sorry. Because that's six. No, I'm forgetting because I've done this presentation one million times. Um, the elders. Asian American, Pacific Islander, Black, African American, Indigenous Tribal, Latinx, mm -hmm. Coastal Community, and the mm -hmm. Sonoma Spring. S Springs Sonoma Valley community. Oh, we're one? Yes. Oh, so okay. So there are two location-based ones, regional, mm -hmm. and the rest are identity, ethnicity, sexuality. Okay, thank you. Exactly. So what they identified, my understanding was are historically underserved uh populations in Sonoma County. And who are they? I'm sorry, who determined these communities of interest? Uh, the Advisory Redistricting Commission. So Ray is one of the 19 members of that commission. Advisory Redistricting Commission. Correct. The, the volunteers. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, ha I have a question. So I'm, I'm kind of confused on the process a little bit. So if this is, if this is really kind of a numbers, it looks to me like it's a little bit of a numbers situation. So how much influence do these meetings and people's input have in, I mean, are you going to take, here's district one and then, okay, well, we need 3000 more people. Are you just going to go grab 3000 more people from another, another area that may not exactly fit into, I'm just kind of confused about how much influence these community um, gatherings really have over a process that seems to be very quantifiable and numerical in, in process. I can take a stab at that, Herman. I think that, so our, the consultant um, National Demographics Corporation will, will take all of this input, all of these things and everything that we're getting, all this community input, all these, and, and we'll, we'll be able to theoretically, I hope, have, have that, that input that they have somehow translated into a, a, a database that will identify these communities that we're, are, are getting are getting identified. So when we're looking at the districts of the map, if we're if we're grow if we're looking for demographics, it, it, you know, so we, we also need to be balanced ethnically too. There's other ways that we need to be balanced, not just um, population wise. There's there's other goals to it. So we'll we will want to reach out to to more ethnic ethnic ethnically diverse areas, and hopefully we'll do that in these chunks. So if if we're if we're moving into an area, we'll want to know. That, that area that, that we won't want to divide that area. That's why we want the input and, and it's National Demographic Corp, Demographics Corporation to use all of that data and we're, we're, we're somehow pr provide us three to five maps to look at on the 18th, along with the new census data. And, and from those, we'll be able to have input and, and we can start, once we see those maps on the 18th, we'll be able to like, okay, we know we've talked to these people, you know, Herman can talk, Her, you know, he's, he knows he's talked to those people. He's those, you know, those people go with the, these people. And so it's a short period, but we'll have some interaction over a few sessions, three sessions, the 18th, the 22nd and the 25th to do that. And then it goes on to the board of um, supervisors, and they also have that opportunity to work with National Demographics Corporation to um, look at that the, the, how, how that balance works out. 
So there's still a lot of opportunities for public input. And again, the best way to do it is to get it into National Demographics Corporation's database. So when they're looking, when they're preparing these, these, theor these maps for us, these hypothetical scenarios for us, they, they, they will have those communities of interest in their system. And there's a lot of GIS and a lot of database stuff and a, a lot of magic that's, um, that happens, I guess, there. So we have to trust their process because we, you know, we, don't, we don't know that, what, what, what kind of, you know, they're using best practices, I'm sure. And then uh, just to piggyback off of Ray, it's also important that I understand your question, Chairwoman, but I think that what's important in this whole process is the input of our historically disenfranchised communities, because once you start into phase two, which I would call phase two being the advisory redistricting commission reviewing three to five maps, if communities of interest find out about the process during phase two, it's harder to influence the maps once it's in phase two. And then once it gets to phase one or phase three, which would be the board of supervisors, that now they only have two to three maps as opposed to the commissioner meetings, they have up to five drafted maps based on all the community input that you're getting. Because I mean, I've had conversations with dividing the coast and you have arguments for, arguments against. Then what about dividing Roseland or what about adding Coffee Park to Supervisor uh, Chris Corsi's district, or what about adding Oakmont to Chris Corsi's district and making the first district go all the way down further into the second district? So these are all things that people that live in each district are, um, we're trying to inspire them to think about that kind of stuff. Um, so yes, it's, it is population driven and to throw for an even more confusing thing, it's not that confusing, but another curveball you could essentially keep the board of supervisors map the way that it currently is because it's not over that 10% uh, deviation. So I think the input is important for the this phase, especially. And then as we continue through the process, we can then say, well, we, Herman did come to our meeting and we did tell him that it's in our feedback. Like we want to see this in case a, com a community of interest sees something that they don't like. It's good ammo for them to kind of, build off of. Thank you. That helps quite a bit. I appreciate that explanation. Thank you. Um, Iris, and then we'll go to public comment unless some, Iris, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one community that I didn't see represented actually for that's important in the Valley um, are seniors. Um, the conditions around senior housing are pretty abysmal here. Um, if you qualify, uh, you can be, you can you can die waiting for housing. Um, you know, seven years, it used to be five years, seven, 10 years now to get on a housing list. Um, that's just impossible. And there, the services for seniors uh, in the area aren't great. And increasingly, um, it, it, it seems I'm, I'm becoming aware of the, of the number of seniors. Um, uh, we're, uh, Dan Levitus sent out a, or put out something about uh, uh, Sonoma, the, the area, the Sonoma Valley having um, about 60% seniors, I think, and, and uh, there's a particular designation for it. So that's, that's something that I don't see being considered. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So we'll go to public comment. And I see one raised hand. Ray, can you help Amy out. Thank you. I, I had two questions. One was procedural. Uh, I guess Hannah is taking notes and is going to post those on like Facebook. Um, is that right? On social media? Correct. Yeah, because these these slides were great, particularly about information about the meetings and things. I went on the um, redistricting website. And there's nothing about these focus groups or town halls or the map drawing parties. So it'd be great to have that kind of information available on, uh, on Facebook. Um, and then I had a question about, um, I mean, you know, in terms of this redistricting, you know, there's no perfect map for every community of interest and every concern. Um, what you wanna try to do, I guess, is to not be exclusionary. Um, I, I, 
I don't know if this is a question that's appropriate for this, but you know, you know, we have. I think in Sonoma County we have some pockets of like the Latino community in various places that you could kind of try to pack in some sense to try to get better representation for for that community. But I don't know that that's true for, for example, the Black community. Um, it seems like it's pretty dispersed. There's not necessarily any centralized area or or kind of uh, coalescing area that would have more representation. Is that true? And how do you deal with that? Thank you. Can uh, you want me to answer that? that question? Sure. So to confuse things even further, you actually technically cannot do racial gerrymandering. So based on people's um, race, but there's um, uh, kind of a gray area where they are looking at, they do ask questions like, what kind of characteristics do you share? What language do you share? What culture or what community traditions do you share in your neighborhoods? Um, so to answer your question specifically, um, I think it was, was it Amy Pearl? Um, there was a conversation we had at another focus group where they said, what about South Park, uh, which is in Southern Santa Rosa by the fairgrounds um, and uh, adding that area into the Roseland district there, cause there's a, a larger African-American black community in South Park. Um, and that was something that, that came up of um, creating a district or adding, uh, like I said earlier, Chris Corsi taking on more of Roseland, then you have a more diverse district and the possibility of um, uh, electing a person of color in that district. Um, but the confusing part, which I'm not jealous of Ray's position on the commission and thank you for your service, Ray, but the confusing part is how do you divide the districts up without actually breaking the racial gerrymandering federal law? Um, and those are things that they're gonna have to figure out on the commission. So I know that's a really terrible, very broad, vague, answer. Um, but that's kind of all I have. There's certain questions to this process that are just very difficult to answer. So I apologize for that kind of vague answer. Thank you. Are there any final questions from the council? I don't see any uh, or any. Sorry, I'm on public comment. Any other public comment at this point? Any other comments from the council? I have one question if no one else does at this point. Okay, although we are decreasing in population in some areas, would the, is this was part of the process a consideration for increasing the number of supervisors and the number of representation, number of possible representatives in, within our Sonoma County? I can, I can briefly start to answer that. So that was, that was like my first question it was like what 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 is what is it what are the guiding principles here and it would have been helpful if we had like gotten like a, a context lesson to say okay here's the constitution here's the, the united states and here's this california constitution and article 25 wherever it is i it says it, it, it establishes counties and and there's two types of counties there's charter counties and there's normal counties and we're a normal county we get five five supervisors and they, they must live inside of their district. So that's that. If you want anything else, you need to go to a charter county. And 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 then and, and I would love to have that discussion in the future. What would happen if, you know, what if you know what would happen if we had maybe five districts and an ad hoc or two ad hocs? Would you then be able to have better representation of, of populations that are that are underserved that you know you're not allowed to gerrymander so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna everybody's got should be just spread out and so the only way to get you know if you if you're a population with only 30 percent 40 percent population and you're spread out over the whole county you know would be an ad hoc position but then it's vulnerable to money so so there's there's upsides and downsides but i'd like to have that conversation in the future and that wasn't part of our process no okay thank you any other questions, comments at this point? Hannah? I just want to say I can't copy and paste out of the chat, Herman. So 
if there is a way for us to get these registrations another way um, for the town hall and everything, or is that all on the redistricting website? I'd like to share that information. Absolutely. So what I could do is I could um, email um, Karina Great. the information yep. and Please. then she could forward it to the whole uh, group here. Thanks. That'd be great. And Thanks. the reason, and I apologize, but the reason that this is not on the county's website is I, I'm doing more targeted um, grassroots engagement, uh, but I did talk to the county administrator's office today. They are going to be uploading the town hall series as well as the community map drawing parties. So that'll all be public, but the focus groups are still going to be more targeted. Um, but you could share that with your folks in your communities. And um, we already have uh, five people signed up for each Springs uh, in Sonoma Valley focus group. So uh, the more the merrier. And thank you again. And I'll share that with Karina this evening. Thank you so much, Ray and Edmund, for being here and sharing the information with us. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray, for your service and all of you for staying up this late. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good evening. Go good Giants. Job. Thank you. Um, okay. That ends our presentations for the evening. Um, I wanted to, we, our next item is uh, consideration of future items. And I just want to read to you what's on the current list. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have a sense of that. Um, we have uh, Permit Sonoma, CDC Alternatives, Homeless Action, City of Sonoma Parks and Rec Task Force. Um, we have Caltrans coming back, the pedestrian bi and bicycle infrastructure. Um, TPW Adopt a Road, PGE Tree Removal, Regional Parks, General Service, Springs Parking Control, Civil Education and What is a MAC, Springs Specific Plan, EDB, Sonoma Fire, Garrett Toy from uh, the City Manager. We have uh, Permit Sonoma coming with the S SDC specific plan and the Madsons project manager. So that's what's currently on the list. For October, we have scheduled Permit Sonoma, the, C uh, the SDC specific plan, the Madsen update, and we can probably add another um, one of the lengthy list. So if you didn't hear something that you're interested in, um, let me know and I'll add it to the list and we'll get them in as soon as we can. I would just recommend um, the, um, Portrait the Portrait of Sonoma because if we're not going to have a meeting in November, October is the only opportunity because it's due in um, December as well. Or I think it's going to be released in November. Do you think um, you can get a presentation on that before it's released? Um, Oscar Chavez is the one um, who's in charge, at least to come and talk about it and put it on people's radars so that outreach can be done and people can um, participate in those focus groups meetings as well. Okay, I think Hannah's hand was up and then Iris. No, it wasn't, sorry. Iris? Okay, um, as far as I know, there's been no uh, release of the spring specific plan. And so that's, uh, I mean, that's at this point, not, it's certainly relevant, but not on the, you know, on the radar. Um, so um, actually I'm kind of wondering, could you, could you send us that list <laughs> so that we could be aware of it? That yes. would be great because you know we just keep suggesting things and and we not need, realizing we need to clean it up a bit so that yep. it but yes we can send that out for sure yeah and um and decide what what's more relevant i was kind of interested in the parks um uh, in a parks presentation but i don't know if you want to do that next time the task force yeah the 2021 20, um that mari carmen is suggesting seems quite relevant though yeah. If, if that if that's possible for next time and i think we have the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure also on the it's important uh, yeah those are really important things on the 
on the list for the next couple of meetings. Thank you. Thank you. And homeless action as well. So there's quite a few things that we have that are really important that we need to hear from. Yeah, there are some that are more relevant, you know, for the specific to the springs than than um, than others. Yeah. Seems like. Thank you. Is there anything else? I've so far I've gotten Portrait of Sonoma to add to the list. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. So um, I just want to say thank you to everyone again for the meeting. Um, Hannah for getting the notes out on Facebook. Again, you hear how popular it is. And Jesus, I know you translated them. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate that. That's so, so important. And to Lynn Marie, who documents this for public record. So really appreciate that. And KSVY for broadcasting. And then to our interpreters, Jordi and um, Anna. And then again, definitely to Supervisor Gorin. Thank you for being here and for your support. And to Karina as well. And to all the council members. It's always a, I look forward to these meetings because I get to spend time talking to all of you and listening to what's going on in our community. So I really appreciate your time. So our next meeting will be at the end of October. We will be moving to a Wednesday schedule after that. All Everybody take the month of November off. And um, I look forward to seeing you in October. And if we can have a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I, I second. And Hannah seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Bye. everyone. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Thank you.